Hello, Wayne County Community College students. I'm Dr. Morrison, and today we're going to talk about lymphatics, the lymphatic system. That's in chapter 31, in case you're interested. Uh, after we conclude, it's just going to be one video for this uh, chapter, because it's not that long. So once we go through it, that'll conclude this chapter, and then you'll go on to the respiratory chapters. But you probably went on with respiratory already because they did precede this one, just in case. It may have or may not, but let's go and learn about lymphatics. So the most important functions of the lymphatic system are maintenance of fluids. Uh, this uh, lymphatic system makes sure that there is a balance of fluids in the internal environment, so within the cellular con uh, construct. And also, the lymphatic system is also interested in immunity, and of course that's the body's defenses. We'll talk about those things uh, a little later, right now we'll just introduce the lymphatic system. I want you to know that it is a specialized component of the circulatory system. It consists of moving fluid. This moving fluid is known as lymph. And the fluid is derived from blood, but it is not blood. But it does come from blood and, flu and tissue fluid. That's where lymph comes from, blood and tissue fluid. And it's a group of vessels called lymphatics that return the lymph to the blood. So the fluid is lymph. And the vessels that the lymph flows through are called lymphatics. Lymph and interstitial fluid. Lymph is the clear, watery appearing fluid that's found in the lymphatic vessels. Interstitial fluid, which fills the spaces between the cells, is a complex and organized material. Lymph and interstitial fluid and we'll refer to it in the writing as IF, interstitial fluid, uh, you know, uh, from now on. Lymph and interstitial fluid, they actually closely resemble. So they both are watery, a watery looking su substance. Um, they both, lymph and interstitial fluid, closely resemble blood plasma and composition but it contains a lower percentage of uh, protein than plasma. Lymph and interstitial fluid contain a lower percentage of proteins yeah, of protein than plasma. Remember, plasma has a lot of protein in it. Globulins, um, oh, albumin is the big one, and of course, fibrinogen. L although lymph and interstitial fluid Half protein is not nearly as much protein as plasma. If lymph and interstitial fluid are taken from the same area, that's the key point. If the lymph and interstitial fluid are taken from the same area in the body, all, they're almost identical. So if I took uh, lymph from this area of my arm and then I guided uh, a needle in, a syringe needle in to get some interstitial fluid, I put them both in a vial, the interstitial fluid and the lymph, they will be very similar because I got it from the same area of the body. But lymph taken from the thoracic duct, which is of course here hanging uh, in the mediastinum, this in the thoracic duct, lymph has a protein concentration that's approximately double that found in most interstitial samples interstitial fluid samples. So if I wanted to take some lymph from the thoracic duct, say I stuck a needle into the thoracic duct, took some lymph out, it would not resemble anything in that area of interstitial fluid. In this area it still wouldn't look the same because the lymph from the thoracic duct has a protein concentration that's almost double that that's found in interstitial fluid samples. So there'll be a higher protein in the thoracic duct than the interstitial fluid. These are the areas that would not look the same. The elevated protein in the thoracic duct lymph is a result of protein-rich lymph 
from the liver and the small intestine. So the liver and the small intestines drain into the thoracic duct, the lymph does, and it causes it to have more protein in the thoracic duct, which makes that lymph look totally different than interstitial fluid in that general area. The wall of the lymphatic capillary consists of a single layer of flattened endothelial cells. So the walls of the lymphatic capillary are very flat endothelial cells, just like it is in the uh, inner lining of blood vessels. I want to remind you that this little squiggly line here means uh, approximately or almost. So approximately double that found. The, the thoracic duct has protein concentrations that are almost or nearly double that that's found in the interstitial fluid samples. Um, let's talk a little bit about lymph that comes from how lymph is drains from the body, right? Let's draw a picture here. Uh, A guy that uh, we'll just say character that has some lip that's draining. So let's just draw. Well, let's give him some shoulders, right? Off the neck. Okay, so this person with draining lip from, as you know, this is going to be considered the right side of the body, and this is the left side. So make sure you keep your, uh, all right. This quadrant here, the upper right quadrant here, let me just, Differentiate that so you will see the difference here. This is the right side, upper right quadrant of the body. This is drained by the right lymphatic. Duct. So we could say that on the right upper right quadrant of the body, um, one quarter or 25% of lymph is drained from the upper right quadrant of the body. On the other hand, this side and all down here in the lower limb, all this in green, that is, this is drained by the thoracic duct. So the thoracic duct drains about uh, three-fourths or 75 percent of lymphatic uh, drainage. One upper right quadrant of lymph is drained by the right lymphatic duct. The rest of the body, the, the right, the left upper quadrant um, and the lower limbs are drained by the thoracic duct. So lymph from the entire body, except the upper right quadrant, drains into the thoracic duct, which drains into the left subclavian vein. Lymph from the right upper quadrant of the body empties into the right lymphatic duct and then drains into the right subclavian vein.
Most of the limp, most of the limp of, of the body returns to the bloodstream by way of the thoracic duct. Remember the thoracic duct hangs here in the mediastinum. And this vessel is considerably larger um, than the other lymph channels, but it's smaller than large veins. So it is a pretty big uh, duct, but it is smaller than uh, even smaller vein, large veins. It's smaller than large veins. Uh, but I want you to know that it does resemble veins uh, in structure. So let's talk about the structure of lymphatic vessels. The structure of lymphatic vessels. So please remember that lymphatic vessels resemble veins with these exceptions. These are exceptions, right? Lymphatics have thinner walls. Lymphatics have thinner walls. Otherwise, they look like veins. Lymphatics contain more valves. You know that veins contain valves, but lymphatics have many more valves. Lymphatics contain lymph nodes that are located at certain intervals along their, oops, their course. So the structure of lymphatic vessels is very similar to veins. They resemble veins with these exceptions. Lymphatics have thinner walls than veins. Lymphatics contain more valves than veins. And lymphatics contain lymph nodes located at certain intervals along their course. Um, the nodes are usually in areas of where you have bending, like in the neck, the elbows here, the creases of the knee, where the knee in the groin area, where we usually have bending is where you'll see um, a lot of nodes, a congregation of nodes. Interestingly enough, there are some nodes that are in the gut, and that's known as Payer's Patches. Payer's Patches. I'll write this up here, mainly because I don't think I'm going to talk about it too much, but I do want you to be aware of them. This is a lymphatic system in the, I'll just say in the gut, in gut, payers patches. So make sure you are familiar with that. So the functions of lymphatic vessels, um, proteins that accumulate in the tissue spaces can return the blood only via lymphatics. So you have protein that accumulate in the blood can only, that accumulate in the tissue can return to, return to blood only via the lymphatics. So you don't want protein just hanging out in the tissues. You want it to be reabsorbed because what does protein do? Protein, what does protein helps keep the, uh, intracellular and extracellular fluids balance. So protein is important. 
If anything blocks the lymphatic return, blood protein concentration and blood osmotic pressure soon fall below normal. And when you get a fluid imbalance, especially if it's severe enough, death will occur. So that's something important to remember about keeping the fluid balanced, and protein plays a major role in that. Lacteals, let me write that word. Well, actually, I'll put this whole definition up here. Lacteals absorb fats and other nutrients. This is a milky lymph found in lacteals after digestion. It contains one to two percent fat known as chyle. So lacteals absorb fats and other nutrients. This is a milky lymph that's found in uh, lacteals after, that P with the line over it means after digestion. Um, it contains 1 to 2 percent fat, and that fat is known as Kyle, like a boy's name, Kyle, but it's spelled like this. Okay? So that's going to be important to know, especially when you're looking at um, in, in the gut as well. Now, the lymphatic pump. It's not like the pump, like a heart pump. This is going to be important for you to remember. Lymph flows through the thoracic duct and re-enters the general circulation of about three liters per day. It utilizes numerous one-way valves that permit fluid flow in a central direction. The lymphatic pump. Lymph flows through the thoracic duct and re-enters the general circulation of approximately three liters per day. Three liters per day is so much uh, fluid and lymph is flowing. The lymph utilizes numerous one-way valves. Remember, lymphs have a lot of valves, mm -hmm. far more than veins. And this permits the fluid to flow in one central direction. Now, interestingly enough, we need to uh, know what establishes this pressure gradient in order for this lymph fluid to flow. You've learned about pressure gradients before when we talked about um, the uh, circulation. You know that that has to go from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. You know that. Um, I'm going to erase this, but I hope that you were able to draw this and remember uh, the importance of the right lymphatic duct draining only the upper right quadrant and the uh, thoracic duct draining the remainder of the body, the other 75%. So it's in your text, but I'm going to erase this now because 
I need to board. Alright. So let's go on and keep talking about this lymphatic pump. And we need to know what establishes the pressure gradient. That's a good question. And while I write this, you think of some answers to let me know what do you think establishes this pressure gradient. Okay, one of them, there's several, is breathing movements. Next one, we'll talk about each one in a minute. Skeletal muscle contraction. Um, how about arterial pulsations, postural changes, and passive compression. This is a massage, really, of the soft body tissues. I want to give a word for all of this because I don't want to forget this. This word tells you everything. talking about here. The word is lymphokinetics. Lymphokinetics. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Let's go through and talk about these um, things that can establish a pressure gradient. So we got breathing movements, breathing movements. The simple process of breathing, inspiring, like taking a breath in, inspiring establishes a pressure gradient in the thoracic duct that causes the lymph to flow upward and through it. So breathing can cause the lymph to flow. The inspiration, taking a breath in, will cause the lymph to flow towards the thoracic duct. Skeletal muscle contractions. Most lymph flow is the result of contracting muscles, contracting skeletal muscles, I should say. As muscles contract, they kind of milk the lymphatic vessel and push the lymph forward, right? You will oftentimes see a lymph node very much connected or near skeletal muscle. That is how important um, it is. Please note that during exercise, lymph may flow 10 to 15 fold, have an increase in 10 to 15 fold. This is why movement and exercise is so important. It keeps the lymph from flowing and, and prevents it from setting up uh, an edematous uh, situation. So your lymph is always moving, circulating. When you are exercising, you're moving, you could get a 10 to 15 fold increase in lymphatic flow. And that's very important. Arterial um, pulsations, just your heart beating. The mere fact that you have a pulse, not that the heart is pumping the lymph, no. Heart pumps blood, not lymph, keep that separate. But the mere fact that you have a pulse is moving lymph along. Postural changes, oh, I, I sit down, I stand up, I'm supine, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm standing on my feet. I'm not lying down anymore. I drop a pin, I pick it up. 
Those things, postural changes, will help move limp. Passive compression, which is a gentle massage, just moving the, uh, kneading the muscles, kneading the tissues, the skin, of the soft body tissues, that will move limp. That's why oftentimes, if you've ever had a full body massage, they sit you up very gently and then give you something to drink, usually some water or tea, because they know that they displaced some fluids and they don't want you to get a rush in your head or you know you will get dizzy. So they know that the fluids may not be where they were, so they give you something to drink, you sit there for a minute and slowly um, take sips of what you were, uh, water or tea, something like that, or juice. The, all of these words are summed up in lymphokinetics. I think this is a uh, Greek. This is Greek. Uh, lymph, of course, you know that's what the fluid is. Kinetics means movement. This lymphokinetics is the activities that result in the central movement or flow of lymph. So if I ask you, give me an example of lymphokinetics, what can you say? Yes, you could say exercise, you could say postural changes, you could say soft tissue uh, uh, massage, you could say um, arterial pulsations, um, you could say breathing, inspiring, you know, uh, skeletal muscle contractions, any of these. Those would be examples of lymphokinetics, right? Let's look at the lymph node structure. No, no structure. So, lymph node structure. So let me give this first lip notes, notes, or glands. Up, glands are oval shaped. They're oval shaped, or it could be bean shaped. They could be small as a pinhead or as large as a lima bean. Okay? So lymph node structure. Lymph nodes or lymph glands are typically oval shaped or bean shaped structures. They could be as small as a pinhead or as large as a lima bean. Now let me just draw an example of a lymph node. I've shown you this during our Zoom time, but I'm just gonna show it again here. And in between this, I'm gonna put some really confusing type of trabeculae, kind of uh, lacy kind of structure in here. All of the things coming inward like this, these, these, on, these four things here, I'll just put it here. These are afferent, lymph vessels. These four, one, two, three, four. This is where the lymph flows inward. Inward. These are afferent lymph vessels. This one, sometimes you have one or two of these where the lymph can flow out. So it's exiting. So you'll remember that E is for exit, and you will say this is the efferent lymph vessel. You can have one or two of those, but the main thing is to remember that you have a lot more afferent, these with 
look able to come in, then you have uh, e-fair. So in between that, you have um, T cells and B cells in here. And what that does is that is where the, say the pathogen or anything that is going to come in and try to harm you, this is where it's typically halted, beaten up, uh, rendered um, incapacitated, whatever. Because the lymph is coming in, but the pathogen is trying to get the heck out. But you see how squiggly it is in here? It's, it's like a maze. They, it, the pathogen can't figure out how to get out. And by the time it tries to figure anything out, it's beaten up and, and so weakened until if it does go out, um, other things out here, macrophages, whatever is out waiting for it, it's going to consume it and it's not going to cause you any harm. So that's what this um, system is for. And that's what it, you know, kind of, that's, that's an easy depiction of what it looks like. Your main thing is to remember what is efferent and what is afferent. And remember the T and B cells are within these nodes. Let's talk about the location of lymph nodes. This is something you will have to know as well. So you need to know where they are. And I mentioned to you before, they're usually in bins or folds, but I also told you about the Pears patches, which are not in uh, bins or folds, they're in the gut. So most occur in clusters, so they're in groups, usually, just usually. They could be pre-auricular. Uh, Remember the word oracle, means little ear. Pre means before, so just before the ear, right in this area, right where the temple is, you have a cluster of lymph nodes. Um, in the face and jawline, submental and submaxillary groups here. Uh, superficial. cervical lymph nodes in the neck. Very much superficial, again, um, cubital fossa. Cubital, that's here where you get blood drawn here. Another word for that, and I want you to remember it, is supratrochlear supratrochlear lymph nodes. That would be in the bend or fold of the elbow, right, and the arm. Of course, where the armpit is, the axillary, and then in the general area where the groin is, in the inguinal area. So, locations of lymph nodes occur, most occur in clusters, preauricular lymph node groups, submental, uh, submaxillary so groups, superficial cervical lymph nodes, superficial cubital or supratrochlear lymph nodes in the axillary area and in the inguinal areas. Those would be the main areas of where lymph nodes are located. We talked about the functions of lymph nodes. Um, they perform two distinct functions, defense for sure, Defense functions will have to deal with filtration and phagocytosis, those two things. And then hematopoiesis. That serves as the final stages for some types of lymphocytes, B type and MAC monocytes. The monocytes um, eventually become macrophages, can become macrophages. Uh, lymphocytes, T, T cells. Oh, the T cells also, they mature, mature in the thymus, right? But we can also say that the lymphocytes are involved, we will also say that lymphocytes are involved in defense functions dealing with phagocytosis and filtration and hematopoiesis as far as B as in boy cells where they go to mature. Uh, monocytes can eventually become macrophages or macrophages and go around and eat cellular debris, consume cellular debris. 
Let's talk about breast tissue now. Breast tissue. All right. Or just let's talk about the breast, period. So breast, as far as it being involved with the drainage, right? So 85%, and usually when I give you a number, I usually want you to kind of have a, a remembrance of it, but we'll see. So 85% of lymph, oops, of lymph from the breast enters the axillary lymph nodes. The remainder fifteen percent enters. Notes, enters notes. along the lateral edges of the sternum. Okay, so breast tissue, or breast lymph, we should say, 85% of lymph from the breast enters the axillary lymph nodes, and the remainder 15% of lymph uh, a remainder 15% enters lymph nodes along the lateral edges of the sternum. So I need you to remember those. So let's just draw. So these are breasts, and here's the sternum here in the mediastinum, right? So let's draw axilla too, just so that you can uh, do that. So I need another part of this arm here. Okay. So now. We have the sternum, the two breasts, and the axillary region, the arm. What are we saying here? We are saying that 85% of lymph from the breast is going to go to the axillary region. So this is going to see a lot of lymph, 85%, right? The remaining 15% of the lymph will trickle into along the edges of the sternum. Like that. And that's 15%. Let me make that a little bigger. So that's the drainage of lymph from the breast and it goes into the axillary. So the point with that is, when a person, and I just want you to know that men do get, uh, end up with 1% of breast cancer, but in general, we're gonna talk about women. When a woman, if a woman has uh, diagnosed with breast cancer, the thing is for treatment that we have now, um, and she requires a mastectomy, she'll get that, remove the breast tissue, um, remove the breast, and sometimes even all the nodes, right? Where will the lymph, the lymph is still gonna drain, um, even though it's no breast there, it's other still drainage. The tissue and some of the nodes that are still there will have lymph in them. The arm will get very, very heavy. And it's up to her to keep making sure she moves the arm to keep the lymph, the lymph moving. It's painful. But if she doesn't do that, she can end up just not being able to even be able to do daily chores like comb her hair or reach for a cup on an upper shelf. So you have to do that. A female surgeon was so brilliant that she decided that after mas mastectomy, she was going to check the rows of the way the, the lymph nodes are arranged in rows. She would check the first row or so, a couple of them, 
and see, taking the pathology, and see if they indeed have cancer in them. If they do not, then she leaves the lymph nodes. If, for example, they all have some cancerous cells, she removes those lymph nodes, but then she goes to other parts of the body and maybe takes some out of the groin, take maybe some out of the neck, wherever, you know, maybe not the neck, because that would be a, um, more uh, scar to see, maybe out of the groin, and places them in the, uh, under the axilla so that this woman can still have drainage. Because usually when they used to do mastectomies, they call them radical, they would take the, the, the breast tissue, they take the muscle, they take all the lymph nodes, it's just like a horrific. So it's all this fluid starts to build up because they had nowhere to go. This female surgeon decided, we're gonna test the lymph nodes as we go along, leave what we can. If we have to take all of them, then let's go to another part of the body and replace those lymph nodes so that this person can have drainage. Only a female surgeon would have thought of that. Only. You know, it, it was just brilliant. Let's talk about tonsils. We'll just mention them. Mention them. Tonsils, because I'm just trying to give you an idea. So, tonsils. This is a mass of lymphoid tissue located under the mucous membranes in the mouth and in the back of the throat. Tonsils are there to protect against bacteria that may invade tissues in the area around the openings between the nasal and oral cavities. Now the palatine tonsils are located on each side of the throat. You know the little uvula thing that hangs down here in the back of the throat and the tonsils are on either side? Those are the palatine tonsils. So, palatine tonsils. They're located on each side of the throat. Then you have pharyngeal tonsils. These are known as adenoids when they become swollen. Otherwise, like right now, if you want to see my pharyngeal tonsils, I just open up my mouth and you wouldn't probably be able to see them because there's skin over it, but they're in the roof of the mouth. They're located near the posterior openings of the nasal cavity. Now, if I was having a problem with the pharyngeal tonsils, they would be referred to as what? Adenoids. So remember, adenoids are swollen pharyngeal tonsils. Otherwise, pharyngeal tonsils are just your normal tonsil, the way it is. But if I ask about adenoids, that must mean that your pharyngeal tonsils are swollen, okay? And you sound differently, too. Lingual tonsils, lingual tells you that it has something to do with the tongue. These lie near the base of the tongue, so I'll put lingual. Just so you'll know, all the, oh, well, at least these three uh, types of tonsils. Palatine tonsils. Pharyngeal tonsils, known as adenoids when swollen, and then lingual tonsils that lie under the tongue. Let's see, the next thing is thymus. I think I'm going to erase this. The thymus is a primary organ of the lymphatic system. The thymus is located in the mediastinum. It's a single, unpaired organ um, that extends upward to the lower edge of the thyroid and inferiorly as far as the fourth costal cartilage, so the fourth rib. Important to know that the thymus is pinkish gray during childhood, but with advancing age, the thymus becomes yellowish as the lymphatic tissue is replaced by fat. When this happens, we call this involution. Some authors um, spell it like this. So it could be either way. Involution, involution, like that. 
That is when, the, as the person ages, the thymus ages, it becomes yellowish, fatty, and it really doesn't have the protective uh, immunity that it had when the person was younger in his youth. The structure of the thymus, it is pyramid-shaped lobes are subdivided into small lobules. Each lobule is composed of a dense cellular cortex and an inner, less dense medulla. Medullary tissue can be identified by the presence of the thymic corpuscles. You can look this up in your textbook and see the structure of the thymus. What's the function of the thymus? Well, the function of the thymus is to play, it plays a vital role in the immunity mechanism. Um, it's a source of lymphocytes before birth and shortly after birth, the thymus secretes thymosin, which is a hormone, I like that word. We've talked about this during our Zoom, thymosin which enables lymphocytes to develop into T cells. So thymosin helps the lymphocytes develop into T cells. Right? The next thing we'll talk about is going to be the spleen. And this will be our final uh, lymphatic organ that we're going to talk about and let me just check but I think that that will then conclude the uh, lecture on lymphatic on the lymphatic system so let's look at the spleen the spleen is located in the left hypochondrium directly below the diaphragm so it's right over here on the side above the left kidney and the descending colon and behind the fundus of the stomach. So you can see that in your text. The structure of the spleen is ovoid in shape, usually they're oval shaped, surrounded by fibrous capsule with inward extensions that divide the organ into compartments. So you're gonna have white pulp. Um, this is a dense mass of developing lymphocytes and you're gonna have this red pulp of, they have the near, near the outer regions that make up um, a network of fine reticular fibers that are submerged in blood and um, they uh, collect, come from nearby arterioles, let's put it that way. What's the function of the spleen? It's defense. Macrophages lining the sinusoids of the spleen remove microorganisms from the blood and phagocytize them. I would say especially uh, encapsulated bacteria, that's the importance of the spleen. It does eat up or macro or uh, phagocytize encapsulated bacteria. Hemopoiesis and monocytes and lymphocytes complete their development in the spleen. And red blood cells and platelets uh, destruction, macrophages remove worn out red blood cells and imperfect uh, um, platelets and red blood cells. So that is pretty much, the spleen is important. Of course, you can't live without the spleen, that is for sure. Um, but it's a vital, uh, but it is a very important organ to have as far as the lymphatics is concerned. But like I said, if you have to get rid of your spleen, uh, maybe due to usually a car accident because it shears as you, as you, the motion of the body going back and forth from the seatbelt, especially if you wear the seatbelt, which I hope you do, um, it can shear the uh, spleen and cause excessive bleeding. So usually we remove it just so you don't bleed out, bleed to death. But now they're trying to uh, maintain the spleen by um, uh, make, stop, stopping the bleeding just directly within the spleen instead of taking it and removing it. A lot of people with sickle cell anemia get their spleen removed because the spleen becomes too large. It's called splenomegaly, and if someone accidentally punches them or hits them on the left flank, it may burst or rupture. So you don't want that to happen, so they just remove the spleen. Anyway, the spleen removal, um, uh, this, it, it, it really uh, accelerates this person's um, 
chance of getting, uh, you know, contaminated or something with encapsulated bacteria. This is why uh, we call it streptococcus uh, pneumoniae. Um, that's why it was a vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine, for people that um, have, have had a splenectomy. So, and also for elderly people to help prevent um, uh, pneumonia from encapsulated bacteria like the streptococcus. So that is it. That's going to conclude the um, lecture on the lymphatic system. I'm trying to get this out as soon as possible, but that's about it. Make sure you go over that chapter. Chapter's not that bad. And uh, just get the gist of it, which I think I've gone through in this uh, lecture. All right, so that's it. Um, if you haven't seen your respiratory videos, go on and finish watching those. And of course, that concludes uh, the lecture on lymphatics.